A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. We are recording this on September 16th, 2020. I'm your host, Anna Garcia, and we have such a special guest this week. You know, we we usually have defense attorneys. We have former prosecutors on the show. We have retired cops. We've had judges. But never on this program have we ever had a crime victim. And and today's guest is not just anyone. Joining me today is Jack Teich, who was the victim of a horrific kidnapping in 1974. And it was one of the biggest crimes of the decade in New York. And it made international news because Jack's high-profile kidnapping happened at a time when there were other high-profile kidnappings. Jack, welcome to the program. Hi. Hello, Anna. Hi. I'm so glad you're here. (laughs) Who else was kidnapped that same year that you were kidnapped? This was 1974. Patty Hearst was February of 1974. And I was November of 1974. And John Paul Getty Jr. was, uh, I believe, December of 1973. So they were all within a year. It's it's hard to believe that at that time the country was gripped by these very high-profile kidnappings. You, at the time, were a prominent businessman who lived on Long Island. You had a, I believe you made steel doors. Your company made steel doors. Yes. Yes. So you spent almost a week chained in a closet. You were blindfolded. You were terrorized by and abused by your captors. And they wanted almost a million dollars of ransom. They wanted seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, which in today's economy would be equivalent to what? Four million dollars. Yes. And they wanted it all cash. Yes. I think the incredible thing that most people will not understand, um, especially our younger listeners and viewers, this happened at a time when people had to use pay phones, home landlines. There was no Internet. There was no texting. There was none of this. And to think that this all went down and the communication between the kidnappers and your wife demanding the money. I mean, you the kidnappers had to prove to your family that. You were alive and you had to I mean, this is like something out of the movies. You had to stand there taking photographs with the newspaper to prove the date. You had to make recordings and pleas to your family, things that that had been written for you by the kidnappers. I mean, it's it's a horrendous thing that you went through. It it was such a traumatic event in our, our lives. I was a very low. We were we were low profile where we weren't flashy we weren't we lived in a modest house we drove we 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 lived a very modest i was young i was 34 years old my wife was 30 years old and uh it was such a traumatic event in our lives that we just never really talked about it uh as a family uh and actually we never talked about it even between us uh for for all those years so (laughs) Two and a half years ago, I just said to myself, you know, it, it's about it's time. Um, whether it was uh, what they call uh, in the in the, uh, the defense department called post traumatic stress disorder or depression or 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 just um, uh, tra- being so traumatized, I said, now's the time I have to just tell it all, and and that's exactly what happened. I. I sat down, and and by the way, many of our friends throughout the years had questions. They were scared to answer, and and they deserved answers. So it was just, the timing was. I just needed to do it. It was time. So time. at the time of your kidnapping, the FBI, which had two hundred agents and police officers swarming yeah. New York, trying to find you. They had a code name for your case, Operation Jack Jack. Knapp. Jack Knapp was the name the FBI gave to the case. And that's the name of your book, 
Operation Jackknap. So your yeah. book is entitled Operation Jackknap, A True Story of Kidnapping, Extortion, Ransom, and Rescue. And I love this picture from the newspaper when you were finally released and there you are and your wife and it's classic 70s. And, you know, the expression yeah. on your face, I think, says everything to a degree about what you had been through. So we're going to talk yeah. about this later in the program. We're going to get to our mm. top cases now. So our two cases this week, Jack, I'm really going to want to get your insight on these cases. So one, a mom in Georgia who drives a bright pink car has been missing since the 4th of July and her family is desperately seeking answers. But first, a man in California has been arrested for trying to kidnap a six-year-old girl from her blind father. This is really a parent's worst nightmare, someone trying to take or kidnap your child. It's the most frightening thing. So uh, this man, the dad is blind and he was, this happened in Los Angeles. He had a six-year-old daughter with him. He's holding her hand and the kidnapper is trying to yank the girl from him. I can't imagine the kind of feelings that this brought up for you, Jack, as a kidnapping victim. It was very upsetting to to read about this story, uh, it, it 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 just it it just really hit home. Especially the father is blind. He had a um, a dog, a, a seeing eye dog. It, it 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 just it's inconceivable. Uh, and that and but, the fear, you know, because yeah. here you are as a parent, you're always trying to protect your children, and this is happening and it's happening in broad daylight and in public this is what is so unbelievable about this case this occurred on august 18th but the accused kidnapper was recently caught that's why we're talking about it now so here's what happened the father who as we said is legally blind caesar palma and his little girl selena were riding on a metro train headed to downtown los angeles when a man on the train strikes up a conversation with them Okay, that's not too bizarre. But soon after, the guy starts acting really strange. And his name, as we now know, is Elijah Lopez. He starts harassing the daughter and the father. And he starts saying really weird things. Lopez asks the man, the father, can I take your daughter home? So, of course, he's already feeling very harassed and threatened. And as you can imagine, he's disabled, so he has to feel that much more vulnerable about the situation and his attempts to keep his daughter safe. So the other commuters on the train jump in. They see what's happening, and, and they want to put a stop to this. But the guy's not giving up. I, I just, I, I don't know what I would have done in that circumstance, right? Because you're stuck on a train, and, and all you can think of is, Lord, just get me to the train stop, right? Absolutely. The, the, uh, the good part is that some of the other communities did step in. And I'm sure that protected the little girl from being taken on, on, right on the uh, train. So they finally get yeah. to downtown Los Angeles. Yeah. The father and the daughter get off the train. He's holding on to her very tightly. And this guy is still following them and still making these threats to take the daughter. I mean, this guy is clearly deranged because he tells the father not to worry because his brother is the mayor of Los Angeles. His brother is not the mayor of Los Angeles. I can assure you of that. That is a lie. So now they're on the platform and they're trying to make their way out of the train station more travelers see what's going on. They see this family, this father and daughter in distress, and they again are trying to intervene to stop this man from bothering them. They managed to get out of the train station, went upstairs, and walked to a bus stop because they're trying to get home. So the guy is still following them. This guy, this lunatic, gets on the bus with them, Jack, and continues to harass them, a whole new set of commuters, and now they're trying to intervene. They're trying to intervene, and by this time, I mean, can you imagine the level of fear? 
I can't imagine the level of fear. And, and, and what's puzzling to me is why didn't anybody call 911? Bingo, because no one did. The Up bus to this driver, point, the, 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 uh, the other commuters that saw it, everybody has a cell phone. Yes. That Nobody was, called 911. They saw what was going on. They yeah. knew enough morally and ethically to try and lend some assistance, but they didn't go so far as to call the police. No. no, no. Right? Okay. That was shocking so, to me. I agree with you. Again, this goes back to taking action seriously immediately when you think there is a threat or something is off to call the authorities, right? The most Correct. important thing in trying to stop a crime. So now little Selena is on the bus with her dad and it's their bus stop has arrived and it's time to walk home. They get off the bus and the guy gets off with them and, and, and the dad is losing it. And the guy, the guy, the kidnapper, grabs the girl and starts to pull her away from the father. And the father is holding on to her as tightly as possible. And this is what's incredible, that the father said he had to think about what to do. To fight the kidnapper would mean to let go of his daughter. And to let go of his daughter would put him at a disadvantage because he can't see and he couldn't chase after them to save her. So he made the decision to hold on to her and not fight him for fear of losing her. Can you, you can relate to that. Absolutely. I mean, he had the presence of mind uh, uh, to, to do, you know, at least the president, uh, presence of mind to do it, to do that. But he may have... He may have a cell phone himself where he could have called. I don't know. The, I don't the, know the answer to that. A and maybe there'll be a little bit of information in this. Yeah. One of the local news stations, CBS2, here in Los Angeles, um, put together this story. And here's a clip. And you're going to hear from the LAPD. And we're going to hear from the father himself. Let's play the clip. It was at this point that Lopez attempted to grab Selena's hand and forcibly remove her from his, her father's grip. I kept on turning around and yelling at him, stop following us, what's your problem? What do you need with us? And when he tried to grab her, it's when I turned around and started yelling at him. What is amazing here is even the LAPD cannot understand how after all these people intervening, the guy didn't get the hint to go away. Like there would be nothing that would stop him from trying to take this child. So this is how the case was finally, or the situation was finally settled. A homeless man, okay, a homeless man and a neighbor saw what was going on. They called 911 and they intervened to make sure that the guy didn't take the child. And by the time the cops got there, the, the alleged kidnapper was gone. But at least Selena and her dad were safe. The LAPD says those two people are the real heroes here because yes. of their intervention. So this case is not over now. Kind of like with your story, Jack, you got to find the kidnapper, right? You got to find right. the kidnapper. So the right. police go through all the surveillance of every um, of every street they went down, of the bus, of the subway, everything to try and piece together what this guy looks like and, and have it line up with the details of what the father and the daughter are saying happened. They finally get a, a good surveillance clip of him and they find the guy down in San Diego, and he's finally arrested. So Lopez, who is 24 years old, is picked up in San Diego and charged with attempted kidnapping. He's being held on $125,000 bail. Lopez has entered a plea of not guilty. If convicted, he could get up to 23 years in prison. I, I'm, I, I cannot imagine how that dad is still feeling. He must still be feeling vulnerable, don't you think, even though this guy's will, if, away? If, not only vulnerable, I, I, I don't know how he could go out with his daughter and feel comfortable um, uh, if, after what happened. It, that, it, they're traumatized. The little girl must be traumatized. Jack, how, Jack how long was it for you to feel like you could go out and feel safe and not feel like you were going to be kidnapped again or that your kids were going to be taken? 
Oh, over a year. I would say over a year. Were you afraid to leave the house? Not afraid, but um, how can I put it into words? It was it was very hard to focus my for that during that year. You know, a lot of it was just blurry, blurry stuff. But um, of course, the the, kid, the the people were in court. You know, it, it, it took two years for them to catch uh, one of them. So it was pretty, probably two years till till one of them till we got part of the story. And I'm I'm just curious. I, I mean, I realize you're yeah. forever traumatized about your kidnapping, yeah. and and I'm trying to figure out what it's yeah. like for this dad. Are there still moments where either a smell or um, a sound or something like automatically just triggers something, and you're right back there, and you you you're full fledged fearful? Absolutely. And I'll tell you what it is. This happened just before Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving in, uh, in New York, the week, week or two before Thanksgiving, the fall foliage, the leaves fall on the ground, the leaves fall on the ground and all the different color, color leaves. And every time <clears throat> we live through that time, every autumn and the leaves are on the ground and it's raining outside or it's misty. It brings back, uh, after all these years, bring, brings back bad memories. To this day. That's the trigger for us. My wife, too. Yeah. yeah. So. Wow. Thanks for your insight on that okay. one, Jack. So before we go on to our next story, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Therapy has become such an important part of so many people's lives right now, especially in the middle of this stressful pandemic. I think everyone could use someone to talk to, and BetterHelp has made it accessible to everyone. So what exactly is BetterHelp? Okay, this is not a crisis line. It is not a website for self-help and guided meditations. This is a professional counseling website and all of the counseling is done securely online, whether by video chats, on the phone, secure messaging. And what's amazing about this is that this is an international tool. You can get counselors in several languages. So this is kind of opening up the world for people who may not always have access to mental health. And here's another plus. In some cases... This is even more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available and perhaps you can even benefit from your health insurance. BetterHelp has a special for our True Crime Daily podcast fans. True Crime Daily listeners will get 10% off of their first month by just following the link in the description box below. Can you see the box? <laughs> Or just going to betterhelp.com slash true crime daily. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash true crime daily. And join the more than 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Once again, you can click on the link in the description box below or visit betterhelp.com slash true crime daily. Our next case is where is Natalie Jones? The 27-year-old woman from Georgia has not been seen since July 5th. She's a mother of two, and her family is, of course, worried. On July 4th, Natalie drove to Jackson Gap, Alabama, which is about an hour or so away from her home in Georgia. She was going to celebrate with friends for the long holiday weekend. Natalie left the party at 1030 at night and a few hours later, 1252 a.m., a text is sent from Natalie's phone to a friend who was still at the party. And the text said, I made it. Thanks. That's the last anyone heard from Natalie. Now, my question, of course, is using today's technology, just because the text came from her phone does not mean that Natalie sent that text. Of course. Right. And You're here correct. we go back to a theme here about the minute someone goes missing, how quickly do the authorities take things seriously to make sure that they don't lose valuable time? Again, such a parallel to your case. 
that the cops didn't take your disappearance seriously in the first 24 hours. Again, valuable, precious time lost. So the police say that the that that was the last text from Natalie's phone, although there were a ton of incoming texts and calls. Obviously, her friends and family are looking for her. The same night that she vanished, police say that she was communicating with someone on social media and also using some apps. They have not released any information about that. You know, this is what's so different about these cases, Jack, than yours. Technology is playing such a huge role in trying to figure out where someone was. Um, Mm -hmm. And you didn't have any of that. I mean, everything had to be done in old-fashioned detective work to figure out what happened to Jack. Where did he go? Listening to the sounds of things like toll booths to figure out distance and time. Right. So... Here's here's an interesting clue talking about technology. On July 5th, Natalie's phone pinged off of a cell tower in Heard County at 5.15 a.m. This is on the opposite end of the county from where Natalie lives. So the question is, why was she there? And that's it. No one's heard from her since. Now, I do believe that, especially when you have a case like a parent, That when a parent disappears and there is no word from them, meaning no attempt to reach the children, uh, credit card hasn't been used, cell phone, nothing. For me, it almost always seems like I can't help but worry that the worst has happened, that Natalie may not be alive. I fully agree. There's no question this was foul play. Uh, When she left the party, was the party in a... A uh, private home or a restaurant, or we don't. I know believe that. it was a home. Um, you know, maybe she stopped for gas. Maybe she stopped at a light. But there's no question that this that 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 that, that, that this foul play. Uh, I find this interesting. So, so, Jack, I find this interesting because when you disappeared and you were being held, you were alive, and. And of course, you couldn't reach anyone. And I'm mm-hmm. I'm wondering, like, how do you balance the your own knowledge of knowing it's possible that Natalie could be alive, though it seems unlikely. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. I would say it's very unlikely. Um, with two little children at home, and uh, uh, and she's a single mother. From what, what I gather, uh, so she ran into some something re- very serious. Very serious, absolutely. And here's the other thing: because she drives such a bright pink car. I mean, this is a, a Chevrolet Cavalier that is hot pink, almost like Pepto Bismol pink. It is mm-hmm. hard for me to believe that no one remembers seeing that car. You may not remember Natalie, but you're going to remember this car. And the police have not been able to find the car. Exactly. Exactly. So so something happened to that car. This is not an easy thing to hide, given what it looks like. So Natalie's family has stepped in. This is what they've done. They actually have taken the route that she most likely took, and they have kind of been retracing her steps and they've been doing it in segments. They've been driving it. They've been doing motorcycles. They're going down dirt roads and then they're sending up um, drones. Thank you. (laughs) They're sending up drones to take a look, especially like in the forest and they haven't been able to find anything and they're absolutely desperate for her return. And here's the other thing. The family says this is absolutely not like Natalie, just like your wife said to the cops, it's not like my husband to Correct. just disappear like this. Correct. Especially with two little ones. So. Exactly. So they, the police themselves have also conducted ground and air searches for her so far. Nothing. It's a 2002 hot pink Chevy Cavalier. 
Uh, Natalie is 5'3", about 130 pounds with brown hair and blonde highlights. We've, of course, putting up photos for everyone. But we also want to remind people she's got tattoos, which could be very helpful because if, God forbid, she's also being held by someone and, and you were to see her in a convenience store, the tattoos would be indicative of having the right person there. So she's got one on her left wrist that says Isaac and one on the right that says Trent. And at the time of her disappearance, she was wearing a pink and white striped top, white shorts, and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation is on this case. They're very good. So hopefully something will come up. Jack, we want to talk about your book now. It's called Operation Jack Knapp, a true story of kidnapping, extortion, ransom, and rescue. And by the way, Jack Knapp is the name, uh, your code name that the FBI gave for your case. Yes. Exactly. I want to start with something that the Daily News of New York said. It's a local newspaper there. And I think they described your kidnapping best. They said a simple request for directions that took a detour into hell. And I think that sums up what you went through in the next in that week. So let's go back in time. I'm going to set it up and then I, I want to talk to you about it. So on November 12th of 1974, you were 34 years old. You drove home from work. You pulled into your driveway of your home in Great Neck, Long Island, and a car pulled up behind you. And at the time, the person's asking you for directions. So from reading the book, you describe how you went toward the car. And when you got close enough, because it was dark, you realized that the man standing there had a ski mask on, had a gun. And tell me how it is you ended up in the back of the car, because there was another guy with a shotgun in there. Right. I got out of my car. I pulled into my driveway, as you mentioned. The garage door was closed, and I shut my lights off, which I, you know, to go in the house. And I look, and and the garage door was was white, and it was still bright with lights. I so I checked my light again. I said, "What's going on?" Then I look at my rearview mirror, and I see there's a two headlights behind me. I get out of the car. As you described it, the driver, they both had ski masks. The driver had a pistol and the passenger had a uh, shotgun. And they asked me to, uh, uh, for some directions, then they pulled the guns out and they said, you're coming with us uh, or, or we're going to blow your head off. So in that split second, I said, uh, th there are woods behind our house that I knew I lived there for 10 years. I said, and it was raining, by the way, it was raining. I said, you know, I can make a run for this. Uh, and they could never, they would never get, get to me because I knew the woods. I knew how to get through it. And um, I then said the front, the side door, to my, to my house where my wife is with my two little kids is about 25 feet away. If I do that, are they going to go into my house? So um, uh, I ended up uh, uh, not running and surrendering. And uh, 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 they pushed me into the back of a little, little uh, car, a Ford Mustang at the time. And that was the beginning of the of hell. The, the beginning of, of hell. You know. I, Jack, I wonder, you, you know, you, you said, and this is always something that I always ask crime victims. In that moment when you thought about running, maybe you could get away from them. What stopped you was the fear of them doing something worse to your wife and your two children in the home, right? Ex exactly. Do you ever exactly. regret? Do you ever regret your decision? Did you do the right thing? No, no. And the reason I the reason I I I, um, I, I, I answered it that way is because actually I wasn't the original target. The original target was my brother. That they tried. We didn't know it at the time. Months later, during the investigation, uh, uh, it all came out. But they actually tried to get him twice over a three-month period, and he knew, he knew something was, was he didn't know it was a kid you know a, a potential kidnapping, but he knew something was wrong, 
And I knew something was wrong because he told me about it. But who would ever expect a kidnapping? Right. Because so, there were no there were no indications of a kidnapping. But what the FBI right. found out later was that this was a plot that was about a year in the making and that attempts yes. had been made on your brother. But your your brother didn't know. He thought it was a, a business proposition and someone kept calling to set up a meeting to get a yeah. contract. And so. There were no there were red flags, but never a red flag that you two were targets of kidnappers. It no. it, it no. didn't reveal itself yet. OK, it so so let's um, let's talk a little bit more about what happened here. Yeah. I read in your book that when the kidnappers took you, they they put putty over your eyes. What an odd thing to do. Yes. Put putty over my eyes, then glasses over that. And then. Uh, uh, put a large piece of cardboard, laid me down on the seat the long way, and then a piece of cardboard uh, over that. And then drove for about 45 minutes. Drove and me in, for about 45 And in the book, you talk about how while you are at the bottom of the car, you have putty on your eyes, you have glasses over that, you know, there are two men with guns, you clearly know something horrible is happening. You're trying to figure out where you are. You noticed that they went through a toll and, and you were counting time and you were trying to figure out because you thought, at least if I can figure out where I'm going or, or how to get away, which ultimately, as we jump forward to your release, was very helpful in helping to figure out where you were kept. Exactly. Um, and and the uh, when you go at that time, they had Coin machines, two coins were dropped in the um, uh, in the machine, and I heard that. And, and that gave the police and the FBI um, a, um, a lead as to what bridges they went over. Because there were only two bridges at the time that had um, a double coin to, to go through the coin machine. And again, so, for our young and again, for our yeah. younger viewers, what they may not understand is there there was no GPS. There were maps. There were paper maps right. at right. that time. There's no such thing as tracking a cell phone or anything. We're talking old school 1974, which is really important, I think, when you look at um, what a miracle it is that, that you survived, that you're alive and yes. that ultimately there were some arrests, although that. That ended up being very disappointing for you. I want to go now to mm. you were held in an apartment in the Bronx. You didn't know you were in the Bronx. You're you're chained in a closet. Describe to me how you were held in that closet. The closet was a, about two feet wide by five feet uh, in length. So I couldn't even I couldn't actually straight lay down uh, the, the whole way. They had eyelets. I mean, this was very meticulously planned. They had eyelets in the wall on either side. So when they brought me into the closet, the chains were already there. And, they, um, uh, and I had handcuffs, handcuffs on. And they <coughs> chained one around my neck to the eyelet on one side with a padlock and on the other side around my uh, feet with another padlock with just about enough slack room that if I wanted to kneel, I, I could, I could just, I could just, I couldn't stand up, but I could just about uh, kneel if I had to, if I had to relieve myself, I was there seven days uh, in that same, in that same room. It was quite an ordeal. I can't imagine. Did you have any concept of time when you were chained up in the closet? Did, did you know how long you had been there? And what were you thinking? I know you kept trying to listen to what you, you, you call the person who kept you there your keeper. Um, did, did you yeah. have any concept of time? Did you know that they were asking for ransom? No. No. They never discussed it with me. They never asked me. Uh, they never mentioned that part other than questioning me about the family, my brothers, my, my father, my mother wasn't alive at the time. Um, 
bank accounts, uh, uh, antiques, uh, uh, the, b- the business. So they, they asked me every question you could probably possibly think of. Uh, but they knew uh, that they actually knew answers to some of the questions before they even asked me. Did you so, think? Did you think at this point that there was someone on the inside? that had knowledge about your business affairs? Because they kept asking about, like, the employee retirement account. Yes, yeah, yes, exactly. Um, Because they knew there there was money in that account. They knew a lot more than they were letting on to me. And they were asking me a lot, many questions where they they knew the answers before they asked the question. Uh, Jack? And many that they didn't know. Jack? At your darkest moments in that closet chained up, did you think that you would get out alive? No. No, no. Never thought I would get out alive. No. When was it clear to you that that you were going to be okay? And maybe even after you were, you were released, you still weren't sure. The... the, the um, when I was released, I I thought that was going to be the the end of it, um, but luckily it turned out. Um, um, and I, and by the way, the thing the the one thing that I have to tell that I have to tell you that that really probably saved my life was the fact that the newspapers had the story. They had the story, and they and they were asked by the police and the FBI, please not. Not not to publish it until uh, we get the victim released, and I have to tell you that probably saved my life because they listen. The radio was on in the next room twenty four hours a day, and I know they were listening to the radio, and it didn't come over the radio because it wasn't in the newspapers. So I think that really helped. Now, would the newspapers do that today? I don't. I don't think so. But they did. They did honor the their request years ago i don't know either jack i have to tell you um having uh, been in this business for a very long time i'm very disappointed by um this industry of mine i don't i i hope that someone has a um i hope that they would have a conscience and understand that a man's life hangs in the balance um but i don't know i don't know if that would happen okay i'm i'm gonna Detour. I'm going to make a few detours here. Um, So, again, again, your your kidnappers, they're holding you for a week. They are being very verbally abusive. They're saying very racist things. They're they're saying anti-Semitic things. You're being bombarded by them, both verbally, besides the fact that you're chained to a closet. I again want to remind everyone, this is a time when there were no cell phones. So while you are being held in this closet, your wife, I want to go back to the moment you were abducted. Your wife comes out, she sees your car, but she doesn't see you, your wife, Janet. And she knows there's something wrong. Your wife calls the police. They come out and they're like, lady, you know, we think your husband's probably having an affair with a friend or a neighbor and that's why he didn't come home. And your wife, Janet, is like, That's no, right. something has happened to my husband. And I'm telling you, Jack, it, it's what, four decades later, and this is still a problem to this day. When someone disappears immediately, oftentimes it is not taken seriously enough by the authorities and valuable, precious time and evidence is lost because of it. That's exactly what happened. and. But but my wife was had the presence of mind to call uh, uh, after the local police uh, came over and and laughed it off as uh, exactly what you said um, that night or or the morning uh, she had the presence of mind to call a friend of ours who was an assistant district attorney and who knew me was older than me knew me from when I was a child. And she called him and said, look, um, uh, his name was Jules. Uh, uh, Jack didn't come home. Something is wrong. Uh, I know something is wrong. And he said, Janet, I've known him since he's been a little boy. 
This is not uh, his character. Let me call you back. So he called the chief of detectives <clears throat> at uh, Nassau County, which, by the way, is quite a large police department. And they came over, and as soon as they came over, they brought tape recorders. They brought the heavy guns. They they uh, taped the phone. In those days, they had these uh, tape recorders with these big tapes. And fortunately, they did, because that played the first tape. The first ransom call came in at 9 o'clock. These... The, these kidnappers made my made my family suffer from seven six seven or seven o'clock the day before until the first phone call came at nine o'clock the next the following evening. But luckily, the um, uh, the tape recorders picked up the calls the call. So at this point, so it's about twenty four hours after you've been abducted, and finally, someone is taking your your case, your disappearance seriously. And thank goodness, because 24 hours after you're abducted, the kidnappers call your wife at home. And that's when they tell her that you've been kidnapped and that they want money. Exactly. And now this case be goes from, you know, something laughable that a cop said, oh, he just didn't come home to this is a serious kidnapping. At this point, your wife is 30 years old. There are two small children in the house. The house is surrounded by police inside, outside. There are guards there, and they're trying to figure out why you've been targeted and where you are. Over the next few days, what kind of demands does your wife make of the kidnappers? Because she's the one who's talking to these people. Yes, well, there were three calls. The first call was just, uh, um, we have them. We have your husband. We want $750,000, and we will get back to you. That was the, pretty much the extent of the first call. Uh, and, and then a second call came in uh, with, with uh, instructions, some instructions of where to, of what they wanted, how they wanted it, mostly hundred dollar bills, um, only about ten thousand, I, I believe, in small bills. That the rest of them, uh, uh, and they were going to put the instructions and pictures of me to prove that I was alive uh, in a uh, garbage can at an Exxon station around the corner from my brother's house. He lived about 20 miles away. Unbelievable. Um, and so in that garbage can is a black bag that I described that kind of looks like a bowling bag. And yeah. there are instructions in there. This is the bag that the money has to be placed into and the instructions. By the time your family raises the money, they raise the $750,000. Your wife is then instructed to go to Manhattan and, and she has to go to a pay phone to get further instructions, and she's carrying the money. And just so you understand, she ultimately ends up at Penn Station. And Penn Station is a massive train station in Manhattan. Yeah. Many, many train lines, lots of tracks, yeah. platforms. The place is enormous, and it's always packed. So here's your wife carrying $750,000. She's with your brother, who's, you know, trying to help yeah. her because I'd be, you know, your life is on the line here. The FBI and additional cops are everywhere. They're posing as cab drivers, porters, you name it, all undercover. And they're using what we would call like a walkie-talkie to stay in communication. Your wife takes the call. She's told where to go. She takes the money. She puts it in a locker. And this is the most incredible thing. With all these cops, the FBI, they lose the kidnappers and the money because the radios that they're using to communicate stop working underground exactly the they didn't have equipment at, at that time that worked underground and they believe by the way they believe the the the, the police believe that they knew they knew that 
the the uh, kidnappers knew that, and that's one of the reasons they carried this thing out on the ground. Four hundred and fifty FBI agents and Nassau County police together were in and around surrounding Penn Station, and they and they follow and they and and they fo- and they followed them to from train to train, but they they. He, he he got on, but they couldn't communicate, so they they lost them. And I spoke to the to the one of the head investigators afterwards, and I said, uh, "What you know? Uh, uh, Jack, why did what happened?" He says, "Jack, he says we could have grabbed him, we could have grant you know held on to him." He said, "But we wouldn't have gotten you." He said the purpose was to get you released. And if we would have grabbed one of them, we knew there were more than one, we wouldn't have gotten you out. So. Okay, so now you've got the money has been delivered and picked up by the kidnappers. The FBI has lost track of them. They don't know where they've gone. And now everyone waits to see what happens with you. That's what's happening on the home front. You are in the apartment, and all of a sudden, something changes. Okay, Jack, you, you, they take you. You think you're going to be killed. You don't think you're going to be released. You think this is it. Correct. They're going to kill me right now. That's what they're going to do. Correct. Absolutely. So they drop okay. you off. They drop you off um, near JFK Airport, and it's near a motel. And you write in the book about how you walked into the motel, you find a payphone, and you called your wife, who at this point is back home with the police waiting. Oh, my God. What was that like, exactly. Jack? Exactly. Well, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I, I called the house, <clears throat> and the phone rang about 15, 18 times. And I said, what's going on? There's no, nobody, nobody answering the phone. Uh, it was a pay phone, you know, one of these pay phones. And I couldn't believe it. So, but as it turned out, they were trying to trace the call. The, the police on the other end let it, ring, let it ring and attempt to trace it. They didn't know it was me calling. So, uh, but she did pick up. and. Uh, uh, that was quite a, a phone call. But the interesting thing was, um, as soon as I got, I, I, they let me off, they, they let me off on a dirt road, a block or two from this motel. And I saw this lights of the motel and I wa- walked up and, and, and uh, I mean, I, I was in the clothes that I, the, that I, I could imagine what I looked like a seven day beard. Oh, and they, put shoe polish all over my face, believe it or not. And uh, I walked in and, and there was a night clerk on. He, he took a look at me and I said, Where, where's the phone? He pointed to the phone. But as soon as I walked out of that lobby of the uh, motel, within maybe a minute or two, there were there were cars coming from every from every direction, FBI cars. Who is the first person from law enforcement who expressed to you you're safe now? A car pulled up. The first car that pulled up, there were three men in the car, and uh, they looked out of the window. They said, "Are you Jack?" Yes. Get in the car. I mean, they hold badges up. No, no, they held. Right? Can you they imagine were, get in the car? It's like uh, I've been through this already. Please. They were. They were uh, three FBI agents, and they. Uh, I mean, I, they didn't say get in the. I mean, they. They. They, <laughs> they were said it a little nicer than that. They. Uh, and I said, well, "Where are we going? We're going to." Uh, I said, "Can you take me home?" No, you can't go home. We're taking you to 69th Street, which <clears throat> was the FBI headquarters in New York at that time. They had many floors in this building. And that's where we went. 
And that's mm-hmm. where you were debriefed and you were questioned and Janet was questioned. Yes. That's when you were reunited with your wife was at FBI headquarters, correct? Yes, that night. So here's here's what I find interesting about your case. Again, reminding everyone how there was very little technology at the time. At one point, they're, the kidnappers are feeding you and giving you very hot coffee. And you had the wherewithal to look at the cup to see where the coffee was from. And that was instrumental in the FBI trying to figure out where you were held as they started to backtrack to figure out, okay, let's get the kidnappers now. Exactly. It was a a Horizon restaurant, Bronx, New York, was on the cup. And so, um, but they had had a lot of other clues uh, of, of what I heard, you know, the f- fire fire department of uh, New York City subways system, uh, the elevated, uh, the ones that are above ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, they they heard those sounds on the tape. Church bells. They had a lot of it, but they never they never found the place I was held at. No, they, they never found the apartment. No. No, and amazing. Not, not because they didn't spend weeks looking for it, months. They never found it. So after you're released, they are still looking for the kidnappers and they're looking for your money. And this is going to take a lot of time. And I'm sure it was very frustrating for you. Ultimately, yeah. the alleged kidnappers, one of them was found in Barstow, California with a brand new motor home and the motor home, according to the cops, was stuffed with cash. It was in the roof. It was, you know, in appliances. Yeah, yeah. It was, and some of the bills actually lined up with the money, which was connected to your ransom. And what's interesting is that four years after your kidnapping, the trial begins and Richard Williams, who is a high school buddy of a man who was, employed by you formerly, Charles Berkeley. These are the two alleged kidnappers. So Richard Williams goes on trial and he's convicted and then you have a heart attack. Correct. It's after like the trial. After, after the, the trial. Yeah. I, I just, I can't even imagine, Jack. I can't even imagine. And that's not the, even the end of the story. That's just it. The man is convicted Finally, the stress is is done. The man is away in prison. You have a heart attack. You're still trying to deal with this, what's happened to you and your family. And then two years later, the other alleged kidnapper, the one who used to work for you and your company, turns himself in. And But the judge says there isn't enough evidence against him. So that must have been a blow to you. But wait, it gets worse. In 1996, Richard Williams, this is the man who was convicted of kidnapping you. His conviction is overturned because African-Americans were excluded from serving on the jury, which if you think back, you know, that was not a very smart decision on behalf of the prosecutors in this case, because that's not fair. And because he was African-American. So... What ends up happening is he is he's released. Then they're going to try and retry him. But there's a fire in the courthouse where all your documents and your evidence from your case is destroyed. This further delays trying to retry this man. Finally, when they recharge Williams, what ends up happening is he pleads no contest And the judge says, you know what? Well, I'm going to sentence you to time served. So he walked. He did serve some time. 21 years. 21 years. Total. And then he was released. So in essence, a few decades later, Jack, after you've been through all of this, do you feel that there was justice? No. But I, I sued him in civil court. I sued him civilly. I gained a, ju- a two million dollar judgment because the uh, and that was in federal court. By the way, I sued him in federal court, and I deposed him. I had him sit him right, sitting right across the table, and I'm, I didn't I mean, the lawyers deposed him, and uh, I was awarded seven hundred and fifty thousand plus interest, and it came to to about a two million dollar judgment. Did you collect on it? No. 
Nope. Not that we didn't try. We only re- recovered about $38,000 of the $750,000. And they, and they sincerely believe that the, that the bulk of the money is still out there somewhere, not in cash form, in, in, in land, in a building, in property. He was a real estate. He was, by the way, he was a very successful uh, uh, businessman. Uh, this Richard Warren Williams. So, Jack, I, I want to talk to you about, so all of this happens, and, and you, without question, yeah. have been traumatized. You have survived. You have also truly experienced what it is to go through the criminal justice system and the disappointments that come with that when you are a victim of crime. How has this changed you, Jack? Um, well, I'll answer that in two parts. Number one, I think the the police and the FBI, irregardless of what you read in the newspapers, I think they were the most professional, compassionate, intelligent group of of, of people that that I've ever been involved with. Uh, And my wife feels exactly the same way. Uh, As far as the court system, the legal system is concerned, that has a lot to be desired. And uh, uh, it was a 17 week trial and it just dragged on and on and on and on uh, with all different motions and uh, mistrial, this and all this. Uh, and that, that really uh, uh, was very, very upsetting to me. And I'm not sure that uh, is any different today, uh, unfortunately. It's very hard um, for a victim yeah. of crime in the criminal justice system to not only get justice, but support, because the system is just so, it's a challenging system. One of the reasons, so when you wrote this book, do you feel better after writing it? Oh yeah, yes, absolutely. I, I, uh, I, 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 it was time. And I, and I just, the timing, uh, the timing was right. Jack, I know this is important to you, but you're not done with your fight yet. You want your family's money back and you're offering a reward to try and get that ransom money back. But Jack, I got to ask you, do you really think that's realistic that you're going to find the money? Well, well, it's not it, it's not only the money. There were at least four individuals involved in this kidnapping. Minimum could have been more, but there were at least four. Um one was caught and sentenced. One was indicted, the one that worked for me, and the indictment was overturned, as you've mentioned. There were two that were never brought to justice and never found. And so the, the, the reward I'm offering is not only for return of, of a portion of the money, but the two that never um, uh, were never brought to justice. And the reason I'm even doing it is because during the first uh, uh, um, six, four, five, six months of the investigation, we offered a reward, family offered a reward. And that brought us, which is a long story, I don't, I'm not going to get into it, but that brought us to Richard Warren Williams through his brother, who was looking to collect the reward. So, so- it worked. So you're not done. You're you're still I'm seeking justice. I'm not and done. And you know what, Jack? That's why you're alive today. Yeah. Because that, you made it clear that you weren't done. You made yes. it clear to everyone on this universe, in this universe, that right. you are not done. And it's Jack's and it's enough done. of a reward, a fifty thousand dollar reward that someone somewhere, uh, an ex wife. Uh, uh, a, a son, a daughter-in-law, someone somewhere knows something. And I'm convinced uh, that we're going to, we, we will hear something. I hope you do get justice, Jack. And Thank if you. you do, I hope you'll come back and share with us. I, I hope you can close you. this chapter. Thank you. It is time for our comment section. These are the crime stories you all are talking about. A topless woman in Tennessee was caught chewing. <laughs> 
on a horse's mane and she has been charged with public intoxication. I think she should be charged with animal abuse. The mane was on a miniature horse and she told the cops that it tasted like candy. I, okay. Deputies say that Cynthia Teeple was seen shirtless, okay, eating grass and dirt from the horse enclosure, and then she was chewing on the horse's mane, and she told the deputy that the horse's hair is made of Laffy Taffy and airhead candy. Um, yeah, okay. Apparently, she finally admitted that she had been doing meth the day before, and she was taken into custody. What other explanation could there be? (laughs) <laughs> you just shake your head. For those of you who are listening, <laughs> Jack is just shaking his head. I <laughs> agree. I agree. So Myrtle K writes, what is this mm. world coming to? Minnie D writes, poor Mr. Ed. He will never be the same. I have to agree. The little animal has been traumatized here. And Brett R writes, this story is so consistent with 2020. Bingo. Absolutely. Yes. 2020 is crazy. All right. Here's the other story from our comments section. Uh, A California police officer uses paper and pencil to help an autistic child find their family. This is one of those inspirational stories, Jack. The Stockton Police Department said that they got a call that there was a child near downtown who appeared to be scared and confused. And there was a, a bicycle cop nearby, found the child, and there was, um, I guess, a bus pass on him or something, and it had information that made it clear that the child was autistic and had difficulty communicating. So the officer gave the child the paper and the pencil to see if if that was a way that he could get some information. And a result of that communication and what other inf- what other documents they found on the child, they were able to locate a family member, and the child is safe. You know, sometimes it's that simple form of communication, right? Paper, pencil. The, the, the police officer was very intelligent to, to, to think of it. Yeah, and to have a heart, right? And to have yes. a heart because that, yeah. that child was scared. Yeah. So Arlie M. writes, thank you, police officer, indeed. My two sons are autistic, and if my sons were in this situation, I would want someone like this helping. I agree. Liliana Z writes, Stockton is the most diverse city. We might not have it all together, but this made me a little proud of my city. I agree. It's an uplifting story. And Nicole W. writes, beautiful, perfectly said. Well, Jack, thank you so much for joining us this week and giving us your perspective of everything that you have been through and you're an inspiration because you still smile and your beautiful family, you still have them. And I love that you have become really close friends with a lot of the FBI people and the cops who worked on your case. Yes. Especially the ones that live with us, live with my wife. Amazing. Amazing how you have forged these wonderful relationships. Okay. So Jack, where can people either find out more about your case or get your book? Where is your book available? Well, there's, there's a website, operationjacknap.com, which is very, very interesting. Uh, but also the book is available at all the booksellers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Simon & Schuster, all, all of them. Everything. You know, Jack, yeah. I want to leave everyone with one thing that you wrote. I, I put a little yeah. tab on it. Yeah. As we're ending this program, this is what you said when you got a chance to um, have your say in court against your kidnapper. You killed me for seven days, not in body, but in spirit and feelings. You made me feel helpless. You made me hate. But fortunately, it gave me the appreciation of life itself and to be free and to love and be close to my family. You can't threaten me any more. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jack. And we all need to remember that. We all need to remember that. Well, this has been a pleasure. 
Um, you can find me on all social media platforms at Anna G News. That's Anna with one N. And as always, you can find our content on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, you can watch us on YouTube on our channel and you can get updates by subscribing to our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. Until next week, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime. Don't do crime.